Hello, and welcome to Homegrown KC, a podcast dedicated to exploring Kansas City's fascinating history and sharing stories from a church past. I'm your host, Laura. Join me today as we explore a piece of Kansas City's history. Welcome back, listeners. Happy autumn to you. Uh, That's if you live in the Northern Hemisphere. I guess if you live in the South, uh, Southern Hemisphere, I should wish you a happy spring, but it's not spring here in Kansas City. So uh, it doesn't quite feel like autumn. It's actually still quite warm, but that's also good. Um, I'm okay with a few warm weeks of autumn. Hold off winter as long as possible. This is Topic 3, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, Part 4, of Series 4, Treasures of Kansas City. I cannot believe I missed it, but the last episode, Nelson Atkins Part 3, was my 25th episode, guys. That's so cool. (laughs) That's a big mile marker for me, and uh, I'm very excited about it. If this is your first time listening, welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you decided to check it out. Please uh, pause, though, and go back and listen to Parts 1, 2, and 3. First, it'll make more sense that way. And then um, after you finish all of those, I hope that you will also listen to topics one and two of this series, which were the Western Auto Building and the Country Club Plaza. A quick reminder, you should get your COVID vaccine if you have not yet. Um, This is also a good time to get your flu shot, but probably not at the same time, right? That just sounds like a lot for your body to process all at once. Also a reminder... For you and your children, if you are going trick-or-treating or even just a Halloween party, please do not dress up in any sort of indigenous clothing. Um, you know, we thought it was okay back in our day. It wasn't. It's still really not, and it's increasingly not okay. Um, you just thought it was okay because you couldn't hear the voices of... Um, the indigenous culture saying, hey, please don't do this. We find it offensive. And now you can hear them. You've been hearing them for a few years loud and clear. So please don't um, quote Indian princess and chieftain. These are, you know, deeply culturally significant, uh, often have religious components. Um, So it is offensive if it's not a part of your culture to be wearing those clothings. Um, The same thing goes for calaveras, or um, as we know them, sugar skulls. That's not a part of your culture. It is not okay for that to be your costume. It is deeply personal. I think it would probably be about the same as if somebody dressed up as the Virgin Mary or the Pope. And you know what? I'm actually going to look it up real quick. One sec. Okay, listeners, prepare to be shocked or not. Those are actual costumes. That is wrong. Wow. That is, that should not be a thing. That's just weird on so many levels. Please don't you or your children dress up as the Pope or the Virgin Mary. And don't dress up as uh, an Indian princess or chieftain or as a sugar skull. Just don't do it. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. All right. Big announcement from my last episode was that I had decided to re-add Union Station as the final topic of the series, and to be honest, I'm once again rethinking that because there's just so much more to Nelson Atkins and it's taken me so much longer than I had anticipated, and I don't really want this series to go for more than the calendar year, and I don't see how I can finish this topic and Union Station, which... You know, I haven't dived fully into yet, but I'm sure it'll be just as big as this one has been um, before the end of the year. Actually, before December period would be good because, you know, holidays and birthdays and there's not a lot of time to work on podcast. Anyways, I'm thinking about it. I will let you know my final decision in the next episode, which uh, will hopefully be out to you by the end of October as well because I have got it mostly written. Um, 
more big news, actually this is bigger news and better news, is that I was featured in a magazine. It was really cool. Um, Voyage KC reached out to me a few months ago now, um, and they interviewed me about the podcast, about what I do here, and the article was published on Friday, September 11th. If you want to read the article, um, you should be able to find it on one of my social media pages, maybe just scroll down a little bit, or you can go directly to the article, and I'll give you that link here. It's voyagekc.com slash interview slash daily dash inspiration dash meet dash Lara dash Darnell. One more announcement. I would like to issue a correction um, in my Irish Fest Homegrown KC adventure on social media. I said that this was in the 90th year. That was very wrong. This was the Plaza Art Fair's 90th year, um, but this was only the 18th year for the KC Irish Fest, which began in 2003. I did make those corrections on the social media pages, but um, just in case anyone missed that, I wanted to get that out there. All right, here we go. On with our story. Recap. Part one was a biographical introduction to Mary Atkins and the Nelson family, for whom the museum is named. Part two was how the estates came together and they formed a plan for a single museum, which finally opened to the public in December of 1933. Part three, I just gushed about the architecture. Maybe that wasn't your thing, but I love it. The architecture was really beautiful, and the symbolism within this particular building was really fascinating. So now we're going to move away from architecture and we're going to talk about some very important people to the museum. First up, we have Lawrence Sickman, born in Denver, Colorado, to May Ridding Fuller and David Vance Sickman on August 27th, 1906. This baby would grow up to be a godsend for the museum. Let me just share a little bit about him. So he grew up in Denver and he went to the Colorado State Preparatory School in Boulder, and then he attended the University of Colorado. Um, I'm not sure which branch, but I'm assuming it. he went to the main campus, which is in Boulder. And he was there from 1925 to 1928. Then he won a scholarship to Harvard, which he attended from 28 to 1930. And while he was at Harvard, he studied under Langdon Warner, who was a professor and curator of Asian art at the Fogg Museum of Art. Um, the Fogg Museum of Art is one of the Harvard museums. They have more than one because it's Harvard. Um, Sickman graduated cum laude with a bachelor's in Chinese language and culture, and they followed that up with a fellowship to study in Beiping or Peiping, China. So first rabbit hole. I was like, what is this city? I've never heard of it. Why does it have a connection with Harvard? Turns out it's Beijing. So the city was known as Beiping during the Ming Dynasty, which was from 1368 to 1644. Of course, power changed hands a few times in between, and it, every time it changed hands, it changed names. But in 1928, the First Republic of China regained the city, and they renamed it Beiping until the Japanese conquered the city in 1937, when it became known as Peking. And then when the People's Republic of China once again reached gain control of the city, they renamed it Beiping again, and it's been known as Beijing internationally since the 1950s. All right, we're going to detour away from Sickman for a minute, because i got to talk to you all about his mentor, Langdon Warner. Dude sounds like a boss. He was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1881, and he came from a very prestigious family. They're well off, taken care of. He attends Harvard, graduates in 1903, and then he starts touring the world, as you do. Um, specifically, he was spending a lot of time in Asia and Africa with a man named Raphael Wells Pumley, who was basically the number one American expert in geology during his lifetime. In 1906, just three years after graduation, at the age of 20 freaking free, he is handpicked to be the curator of the Department of Asiatic Arts at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. This is a big deal, okay? Big, big deal in the museum world to just be handpicked like that. 
And he only has a bachelor's. Probably no other museum work experience. That does not happen today. Today, you have to have a PhD and a lifetime of experience before you can become a curator at a major museum like the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. So Warner works there until 1913 when he moves to Beijing, aka Beijing, and he established the American School of Archaeology in Peking on behalf of the Smithsonian Institution. This is a big deal. And then he went on to become, quote, the field agent for research in Asia for the Cleveland Museum of Art, director of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the curator of Oriental Art at Harvard's Fogg Museum of Art. End quote. So that's where Sigmund meets him is when he's working at the Fogg Museum. But dude, he's like everywhere doing everything. He is a boss. All right. I'm going to introduce a third character, um, Joseph Paul Gardner. He was born October 20th, 1894 in Boston, Massachusetts. His parents were Joseph Alexander Gardner and Emma Blanche Crowell. Couldn't find any information on siblings. He attended MIT, but it sounds like he left before graduating in, you know, maybe 1917 so that he could fight in World War I. According to one of my sources, he eventually became a captain and, quote, designed trains for railway artillery with the heavy artillery board. And for his bravery at the front, he was awarded the Croix de Guerre with palm and something French I can't pronounce, sorry, end quote. He was only 21 at the time. After the war, he spent his summers in Europe studying architecture, but then the rest of the year, Guess what? He swerved into ballet. <laughs> Engineering, architecture, and ballet. I mean, of course, that's the combination we're going to end up with, right? I don't know where this came from. He must have danced as a child or something. He joined Anna Pavlova's ballet company for nine years, and then he became the ballet master for the Washington Opera Company and co-owned the Chikurnov. Mm, I think I'm saying that right. Chikurnov Gardner School of Dancing in D.C., and during that time, <laughs> while he's doing all of this dancing, which is a like two-time full-time job, he's also studying at the George Washington University in D.C. And he graduated with his B.A. in 28. And then in 1930, he started his art studies at, you guessed it, Harvard. <laughs> My source said he studied at the Fogg Museum, so I'm guessing he knows Warner and Sickman. Now, all three of these men are integral to the start of the museum, its collections, and early policies. Paul Gardner graduated from Harvard in 1932, and he became an assistant to the Rock Hill, uh, sorry, William Rock Hill Nelson trustees. Then in 33, they hired him to be the first director of the William Rock Hill Nelson Gallery of Art. Um, Gardner's job was all-encompassing, um, even before he became the director, when he was just their assistant. Quote, after his appointment in February 1932, Gardner worked from the trust office at 418 Bryant Building, but by the end of the year, he had set up a makeshift office in the new museum. Using orange crates for furniture, he unpacked and cataloged art objects, answered countless inquiries, and offered advice to the trustees. Both on the interior plans of the museum and on the choice of staff, Gardner gravely influenced the trustees' deliberations. He made decisions on wall coverings, seating arrangements, and the size of the rooms. His career as a dancer in the theater provided important background, for he saw each gallery as a stage set and tried to make each vista beautiful. He believed that the display room should be small and intimate and contain a chair or bench for the patron who wished to spend time in contemplation. End quote. So, in this case, we can see how the ballet is a huge influence on him. It actually played out pretty well. Now, remember, I said Warner was such a BFD in his field. Um, BTW, he and J.C. Nichols had actually been classmates together at Harvard. So that the trustees, of which J.C. Nichols was one, was like, Hey, buddy! And they hired him to buy art for the museum. And he was even named the museum's Asian art advisor from 1930 to 1935. And Sickman, who was Warner's protege, while he's hanging out in Beijing, living his best life, he runs into his old professor, 
who had gone over to China to find this art and buy it for the museum. And so the museum trustees in 31, they're like, oh, okay, Sickman, you're going to join him. And together they're buying art for the museum, which has not yet opened to the public. Um, Because remember, they began construction in 1930, but they didn't open until 1933. And also remember that this is the start of the Great Depression, which ran from 1929 to 1939. I think Americans tend to think of the Depression as solely an American experience because of the way that it's taught in schools, but it's really a global phenomenon. So the trustees have a few million dollars of art at their disposal. They have these two experts in China, and the world economy is in the tank. The Chinese government is like, we need money, and they're just getting rid of everything at ridiculously cheap prices, like well, well below worth its actual value. Some of the items they bought for the museum include, quote, three or four paintings directly from the ex-emperor, Pu Yi, the last emperor of China and of the Qing dynasty, who had reigned as a child with regents from 1908 to 1912. Among the paintings acquired for the Nelson on this visit was... The Life Cycle of the Lotus, a Ming Dynasty hand scroll painted by Chin Chun, end quote. Other examples include a Chao Dynasty bronze Zhu Deyong's Fisherman's Evening Song. Sorry, Chinese history and uh, language is not my thing, so I might not be pronouncing all of this exactly right. Um, a Song Dynasty hand scroll and a relief from a Buddhist cave chapel in Longmen, Henan province, among several others. Something else these three men have in common is they were all monuments men. Okay, I've been waiting a really long time to talk about this next segment, the monuments men and women. If you don't know what this is, you're about to learn. This is one of the greatest accomplishments of the museum world in the 20th century. So, during World War II, the Nazis stole or destroyed pretty much every major work of art from every museum or private collection in every city, nation, and country that they conquered. There is a documentary about these thefts and the Allied attempts to reclaim this art called The Rape of Europa, and I think the name says it all. It's actually very clever because it harkens back to Greek mythology, so the name has multiple meanings to it. Um, There's a book by Robert Edsel. He has a few books, but this one was made into a movie with a cast of just amazing actors, so I figure it's probably his most well-known book. The book is called The Monuments Men, Allied Heroes, Nazi Thieves, and the Greatest Treasure Hunt in History. Very good title. Very catchy. Uh, The movie is simply called Monuments Men, and it stars George Clooney, Matt Damon, Bill Murray, Kate Blanchett, and John Goodman. Here's how the story plays out in real life, okay? Hitler rose to power as the Chancellor of Germany in 1933. World War II began in 1939 and lasted until 1945. The Japanese military sneak attacked Pearl Harbor, an American naval base in Hawaii, on December 7, 1941, and this became the catalyst that spurred the American government to officially join the Allies in the war. So three weeks later, on December 20th, 44 American museum administrators and curators meet at the Met in New York, and they are forming a plan of how to protect their collections. Um, I should also say there were um, museum officials in France who did the same thing back in, like, 1934, way before the war started, right after um, Hitler had come to power. Okay, um, anyways, there's a Mr. George Stouts, who is the biggest push behind the creation of the Monuments Men and Women, um, but because he doesn't directly relate to the story, I'm not going to get into him. January 1943, so it's been two years since we joined the war, um, President Roosevelt finally establishes the American Commission for the Protection and Salvage of Artistic and Historic Monuments in War Areas also known as the Roberts Commission. It was named after the chairman, Supreme Court Justice Owen Roberts. And then a few months later, we finally have the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives Subcommission established in February 1944. This is the Monuments Men and Women. 
It's a group of about 345 men and women from 14 nations, quote, most of whom volunteered for service in the newly created Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives section during the World War II. Many had expertise as museum directors, curators, art historians, artists, architects, librarians, and educators. Their only job description was simple, to protect cultural treasures as far as the war allowed, end quote. Um, They were largely from America, England, and France. However, there were also Canadians, Hungarians, um, people from the Netherlands, Russia, Czechoslovakia, Japan, and Belgium. They knew what had happened to all the stolen art and where it had been taken. Um, It had been taken to the Alatusi salt mine in Austria and to another cache in the Merkur salt mine in Germany, and a third in the Siegen copper mine, also in Germany. And they knew where it had gone because they'd been keeping track of it, right, this whole time. And then they keep track of it further once it gets into Nazi hands because we're intercepting Nazi communications and decoding it. All of the stolen art, uh, especially from Jewish private collections and, like I said, museums, is being stored in these mines until it can be relocated to Hitler's personal museum, the Führer Museum, uh, also known as the Linz Museum in Linz, Austria. And it wasn't taken directly there because of the the war itself, the fighting. According to the Monuments Men Foundation, quote, in the last year of the war, they tracked, located, and in the years that followed, returned more than 5 million artistic and cultural items to the countries from which they had been taken. Several hundred monuments men and women remained in Germany, Austria, Italy, and Japan for up to six years after the conclusion of hostilities to coordinate the return of stolen works of art and other cultural objects to the countries from which they had been stolen. During that time, they played instrumental roles in rebuilding cultural life in the devastated countries of Europe by organizing temporary art expeditions and musical concerts. By the time the lost monuments monuments men left Europe in 1951, they had overseen the return of some 5 million cultural objects, end quote. And of course, restitution of this art is actually still an ongoing process, but that is a completely separate discussion. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, Warner joined the army and taught Japanese language, culture, and history to the civil affairs officers. As a monuments man, Langdon Warner, quote, created the official list of monuments for Japan, China, Korea, Siam, and Thailand, as well as published a pamphlet entitled The Monuments of China, end quote. After the war, he moved to Japan for a short time before moving back to Massachusetts. He returned to his work at the Fogg Museum and retired in 1950. He died in Cambridge, Massachusetts on June 9, 1955. Paul Garner, quote, served as director of the MFAA section of the Allied military government for the liberated provinces of Italy until war's end, end quote. After the war, he returned to KC in 1945 and resumed his position as the museum director until he retired in 1953. After his retirement, he moved out to a ranch that he owned in New Mexico, and he remained there until his death on September 11th, 1972. Lauren Sickman left the museum to serve in the Army in 1942, but he didn't join the Monuments Men and Women until 1945 when, quote, he was selected for service with the Arts and Monuments Division of the Civil Information and Education Section of General Headquarters of the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers in Tokyo, Japan. The Arts and Monuments Division functioned as the Far East Office of the MFAA in the Pacific Theater. He arrived at headquarters in Tokyo in early December 1945. His assignment took him to Korea, where he inspected museums and cultural monuments, end quote. Upon his return to Kansas City in 1945, he resumed his post as the creator of Oriental Art. And then, jumping ahead a little, he was actually named successor to Gardner as the museum director in 1953. He retired from the museum in 1977, and he died on May 7th, 1988, in KCMO. And, guess what? There are another three monuments men that are associated with the Nelson Atkins Museum. Surprise! So, these other three, I didn't spend as much time on them because they didn't play as large a role, but still pretty cool. We have six 
out of, you know, 350. It's kind of a lot for one museum. Anyways, um, first we have a Mr. Joseph Keller. He was born in Colorado Springs in 1918, and he studied classics at Colorado College and then art and archaeology at Princeton. He enlisted in the Army in 42 and officially joined the Roberts Commission in 45. He was the head of the MFAA branch, OMG Greater Hesse in Germany. That's like the official um, name of the his post. After returning to America, he completed his PhD in art and archaeology at Princeton, and then he became the curator of European art for our museum from 1954 to 1959. He... he then returned to Princeton in 1960 to become the director of the Princeton University Art Museum. He retired in 72 and he died in 1985. We also have Otto Whitman, who was a Kansas City native, born in 1911. He graduated from Harvard in 1933 and returned to Kansas City. One of my sources said he was the curator of Prince in the newly opened... Rock Hill Nelson Gallery of Art, and the other says that he was only a registrar. Now, both of these sources are highly researched and very accurate, so I have a hard time believing that one of them is wrong. I'm wondering if, like, his official title was curator of prints, but then, like, the work that he did, which today it would just be your title as registrar, but, like, that's the kind of work that he did, but it wasn't his official title. Maybe something like that. In 1937, Paul Sachs, who was another monuments man from Harvard, hired Whitman to be his assistant so that he could complete his graduate studies for free. He then joined the Army in 1941 and, quote, Whitman later became officer in charge of the Washington, D.C. headquarters of the Office of Strategic Services. He traveled to Europe on many occasions conducting investigations on Nazi looting activities, but most notably the dealings of the... E-R-R, end quote. Um, my German is rustic. I really don't think I can properly pronounce the full name of the E-R-R in German. He returned to the States in 1946 and joined the Toledo Museum of Art. He advanced within the ranks of that museum, and then he went on to work for the Paul Getty Museum in L.A. The Getty Museum is a BFD in the muse- museum world. This is, whoa, okay? And he died in California in 2001. Then finally, we have James Alexander Reeds, who is another native son. He was born in KC in November 1921. He was actually pursuing a uh, medical degree before World War II began. He enlisted in 1942 and became a German interpreter. He joined the Monuments Men in 1944 as a clerk. He stayed in Europe for a couple more years after the war, and uh, he met and then married his wife over there. They moved back to America in 1947. Reed became a teacher and earned graduate degrees in linguistics. In fact, he taught linguistics at multiple universities uh, across America, but he taught at UMKC, which is where he retired from in 1990. And then instead of spending his retirement, you know, relaxing like you should, he decides to become a docent at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. And he stayed in Dawson until he died in October 3rd, or sorry, on October 3rd, 2012. That is where we're going to end our story for the day. Thank you for joining me as we explored more of the Nelson Atkins Museum history. My main source has been the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, A History by Christy Wolferman. I'm using her second edition, which was published in 2020. Um, Other sources include a news article by KMBC, PendergastKC.org, KCHistory.org, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art Archives, uh, which has a collection of papers um, that includes biographical information for most of the men discussed today, um, particularly uh, Warner and Sigmund. Um, I'm also heavily used the Monuments website. That's www.monumentsmenfoundation.org. Fabulous website. So much information on there. Um, They have biographical profiles on every single Monuments Men and Women. They have information about all the works of art that they worked with. Um, They were stolen and they recovered. 
Um, they have a timeline of events and they have other historical information. Really got to check it out. The way that I had to cut this out, this was up in the earlier part of the story, but I'll just give a quick summary. Uh, the way that the Monuments Men Foundation came about is really cool. So this guy and I don't remember his name at the moment. Oh, actually, I know what? It was Edsel. It was um, the guy that wrote the book that became the movie, The Monuments Men. Okay, so he moved to Europe, I want to say England. And then like a year later, he got a divorce and he went through a midnight life crisis. But instead of becoming some weird um, old bro with a sports car, he dived into Nazi history, specifically as related to the art. And then he moved home to the States and he started his own company, continuing this research. It grew into the Monuments Men Foundation. And in 2018, 2019, if I'm remembering correctly... The foundation, which had gathered all these original sources and, you know, all the research material, they are now located in the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Very cool. Um, for merchandise, you can visit zazzle.com slash store slash homegrown underscore KC underscore store. Got a lot of cool stuff available. Make sure you follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Twitter. I'm a homegrown KC on all of those. Also, make sure you rate and review me on Apple Podcasts. The more ratings and reviews I get, the higher up in the charts I go, and the easier it'll be for more people to find me. You can visit my website for additional information. That's homegrownkc.wordpress.com. Yes, it is still way out of date. Yeah, I will update it eventually. <laughs> Someday. In the far future. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, episode suggestions, or you just want to talk about cool history stuff with me, um, you can email me at homegrownkc at podcast. Sorry, let me try that again. Homegrownkcpodcast at gmail.com. Um, or you can direct message me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Check me out on Audia. It's a new audio-based platform. Um, create a profile, search Homegrown KC, follow the show. All the episodes will be on there. I hope you'll consider becoming a supporter of the show as well. You can do so by subscribing to Patreon slash HomegrownKC or by going to RedCircle.com slash HomegrownKC. You sign up, create an account, subscribe to the show. You'll be charged that day and then on the first of every month afterwards. It's only $5 a month. Everything you guys give goes back to the show. Um, if you become a supporter, you'll also get an item from the store valued at $5 or less. A shout out on each episode, so uh, let me take a moment to say thank you to Bjorn and Joan for your continued support. Appreciate you. And you get access to exclusive bonus content. This is what you guys really want, I think. Um, I have interviews with um, other historians and museum professionals from the Kansas City area. For this series, um, specifically this episode, I interviewed Christy Wolferman about her book that I've been using. Um, my latest patron episode was an interview with Andrew Gustafson from the Johnson County Museum. Very cool. I've got a couple more planned for the end of this year, and then we'll be going on to 2022. Thanks goes out to my very talented sister-in-law, Sarah McCombs, who created my logo. To the Dear Misses for the use of their song, Kansas City, as the intro and outro music of the show. And to local libraries, which enabled me to gather my research. And thank you for listening. Cheers. seem to shake this feeling and I can seem to get you off my mind